Well, hello everyone. It is 11 a.m. Eastern Standard here in New York, so we're going to kick off. I'd like to wish you all a good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. And welcome you to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we're very pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's 2013 webinar series. Today's webinar was developed in collaboration with Lighting Global, and our guest presenters are Arne Jacobson and Peter Allstone. My name is Jana Aranda, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. When I'm not doing this, I work with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, where I'm a senior program manager. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar, Lighting Global Support of Clean Energy Markets for the Rural Poor. Energy is a key focus area at E4C, and we're always seeking to share insights and developments shaping the market. To do so, we've invited today's presenters, Arnie Jacobson, who is the Quality Assurance Team Lead for Lighting Global and the Director of the Shops Energy Research Center at Humboldt State University, and Peter Alston, the uh, Quality Assurance Technical Specialist at Lighting Global and PhD candidate in the Energy and Resources Group at UC Berkeley. Gentlemen, we thank you both for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series generally. Along with myself, we have Holly Schneider-Brown and Alex Torres of IEEE, as well as Victoria Chung, who works on developing and delivering the webinar series. Thank you, team. If anybody on the series today has questions or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact us via the email address visible on the slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Before we get uh, going with our presenters today, we thought it would be a great idea to remind you about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a global community of now over 15,500 technically-minded members and more than 30,000 social media followers, such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs, and social scientists who work together to solve critical humanitarian challenges. Whether in water, energy, health, agriculture, sanitation, or other areas faced by underserved communities around the world today, we invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of our coalition, including professional societies such as ASME, IEEE, ASCE, SWE, and ASHRAE, as well as academic supporters, supporters like MIT's D-Lab, and international development agencies such as USAID, EWBUSA, and Practical Action. Furthermore, you have an access to a passionate and engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Registration is easy and it's free. Check out our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. The webinar you are participating in today is one installment of the E4C webinar series. This free, publicly available series of online seminars showcases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field who bring leading edge technology and solutions to bear on global humanitarian development challenges. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on the E4C webinar webpage. You see the URL here. If you're on Twitter today, I'd also like to invite you to join us in the conversation by using the hashtag E4C webinars. E4C's next webinar will be on Tuesday, November 19th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with, on the topic of building and running community cellular networks with Open BTS. Our presenter will be Curtis Heimel, who is a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. We seem to be giving UC Berkeley a lot of love today. To learn more and register, please visit the E4C webinar uh, page in about 24 hours when we'll have the link up for registration. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's see where everyone is from today. In the chat window that is located on the right, uh, please type your location. I'll, I'll give everybody an example here by typing out uh, my location. There we go. We got some folks already, already letting us know where they're from. 
see some folks from uh, the United States, Boston. Oh, we got some folks from India, uh, Brooklyn, Houston, all over the map over here. Very cool. Oh, a number of a number of participants from India today, and uh, of course, always Hawaii and Greece. Very cool stuff. So any technical questions or minister problems should go in this very same chat window. You can also feel free to send a private chat to Holly or Yana, myself. You can also use the chat window to type in any remarks you may have. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window, which is located immediately below the chat window, to type in your questions for the presenter. This will allow us to uh, keep track of all the questions as they're coming in and make sure that they're now lost or pushed down. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. If that doesn't work, you can use the call in number for the teleconference. You may also want to try opening WebEx up in a different browser. Sometimes that works that out. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour for those of you who are tracking those for your professional licenses, please provide your full name and the date that you completed this webinar as well as the code that we will provide at the end of this session. Uh, compile that all in an email and send it to ead-ceuadmin at ieee.org. And we'll repeat this information again at the end. So thank you, everybody, for ensuring uh, your information about where you're from. It's great to have you all join us from all over the world. I'd like to introduce today's presenters to you all. First, we have Dr. Arnie Jacobson, who, as I mentioned, is the director of the Shaft Energy Research Center, and an associate professor in the Environmental Resources Engineering Department at Humboldt State University. He serves as the technical lead for off-grid lighting product quality assurance for the World Bank Group's Lighting Global Initiative, which is associated with the Lighting Africa and Lighting Asia programs. He has a PhD from the Energy and Resources Group at the University of California, Berkeley, a master's degree focused on environmental resources engineering from Humboldt State, and a bachelor's degree in physics from Earlham College. His areas of research and work interest include renewable energy technologies, energy access in off-grid areas, and clean energy deployment policy. Arnie's work is interdisciplinary and combines renewable energy engineering, energy policy, and social geography based on a based approach to international development studies. He has extensive experience worldwide. Uh, joining him today is Peter Allstone, who is a consultant on clean energy systems and a PhD candidate in the UC Berkeley Energy Resources Group. He is a core member of the Lighting Global Quality Assurance Team, which supports the market for modern off-grid lighting in the developing world. Peter's work for Lighting Global includes technical and engineering support, policy development, and market intelligence. His research focus areas include information technology approaches to clean energy development, understanding markets for demand-side energy technology, and integrated energy policy. Peter has degrees in chemical engineering and environmental systems. So I'd like to welcome both of you, um, tremendous gentlemen here, to, to share with us uh, some of your insights and hand over the presentation. Thank you, Iana. So I'll be getting started today, uh, and I'll give some background on the market for off-grid lighting. Uh, and then I'll pass over to Arnie, who will talk about our work uh, through Lighting Global to support that market. Uh, and so as a bit of context, I want to remind everybody of uh, last summer, there was a big blackout in India. Uh, 600 million people were without power for two days. Uh, and that really reflects um, how tenuous grid access can be uh, in the developing world. Um, and that, that was front page news uh, in a lot of newspapers, and, and we heard about it a lot. What you don't hear about every day is that there's a permanent blackout for about 1.4 billion people on the planet. Uh, and those are people who don't have access even to that, that tenuous grid uh, that may or may not uh, be available. And, and so this is, this is the broader context of people without access to the grid, uh, people with access to the grid, and it may or may not be reliable. Um, and when there's a blackout, whether it's permanent or whether it is just something that happens every once in a while, uh, people turn to fuel-based lighting. That's the incumbent technology. Uh, and 
that's that's what uh, you know that's what lighting was before electricity and still is for people who don't have it. Um, Fuel-based lighting is expensive, unhealthy, and inefficient. Uh, I'll talk you know I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, and here's some photos that just show the range of how fuel-based lighting works in the developing world. You know, people on the left, there are kerosene sellers in every town uh, who sell kerosene. Um, people use a variety of different kinds of lamps to, uh, to, to light their homes. Uh, I, I should say kerosene is not the only fuel that gets used. People also use diesel fuel and candles. Um, there are some other stranger, or what seem like stranger, fuels like pitch wood, um, or we've even heard of people burning um, tires and sandals in very extreme situations. Uh, but in any case, kerosene is a major fuel here. Um, it's about a $25 billion per year industry globally. Uh, so it, it costs a lot of money uh, for people who don't have access to electricity uh, to provide that, uh, the light that they need. And what, what we're here to talk about today is the promise of modern off-grid lighting. Uh, now, LED-based lamps, so that's light-emitting diode uh, technology, um, those are emerging as an affordable substitute for fuel-based lighting for low-income people. Uh, LEDs are a technology that's been progressing very rapidly, and, it, and it's only been in the last five years uh, that it, they've been cost competitive uh, in terms of having high enough performance and low enough cost uh, to really be a viable substitute. And, and we're really seeing the market take off in response to that. Um, we, I want to highlight that these LED lighting products are not a substitute for grid power, but the reality is that a lot of people are not going to have access to the grid for the foreseeable future. So these can be a technology that bridges that gap. Um, they're an affordable form of pre-electrification. It's better than fuel-based lighting, not as good as a connection to the grid. Um, and also, the quality of the products is quite mixed that are entering the market, uh, with market spoiling occurring. So market spoiling meaning that if somebody tries out a poor quality product and has a bad experience, uh, they're much less likely to try out a, a product that may be better quality and, and may actually meet their needs uh, quite well. And uh, focusing on uh, avoiding market spoiling is, is one of the core goals of Lighting Global. Uh, as, as I mentioned, there are 1.4 billion people who currently lack access to grid electricity, uh, and that's a large potential market for these, these products, and there are a lot of people entering this market for a lot of firms. 96% uh, of all the people without access to electricity are in Africa and Asia. Uh, and I, I should highlight that the trend uh, looking forward is that most of the people who are, who are going to be off the grid in the next 10 to 20 years are, are going to be in Africa. The, the pace of electrification and grid extension in Asia is much faster. Um, and in Africa, actually, the projection is that more people will be off the grid in 20 years than are today. Uh, and that's because population growth is outpacing electrification in, on the continent of Africa. Uh, these people are, are also not rich. That, that goes along with not having um, electric power uh, that's correlated. Um, and they can't afford very high cost alternatives to grid electricity. So these relatively small solar and LED off-grid lighting products um, are affordable uh, to people, and they can provide good quality lighting. So the, the photo below shows a woman using uh, an off-grid light uh, to, to cook. Uh, so that, that's just one example of you can imagine there's a very wide range of applications that people need to use lighting for, uh, cooking, studying, socializing, uh, and these, these products attempt to meet those needs. And there are, for people who do switch from kerosene to modern off-grid lighting, there are a range of benefits. Um, first, in many people's minds, it is economic. 
that these have a relatively fast payback period for buyers. So when you compare the amount that people spend on kerosene uh, that they no longer have to spend to the cost of one of these products, um, the, the cost range for these products is anywhere from 10 to 100 or more dollars, and, and there's a range of performance that goes along with those costs. Um, but, but you see a fast payback on the order of months, so maybe six months. It, 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 of course, it completely depends on the context and which product they purchase. On, on a macro scale, when, when people in a country adopt off-grid lighting, if that country is an oil importer, uh, that, that means that more cash is staying in the country. So that if you draw a boundary around the country, as we do, um, less cash is leaving that country to purchase uh, oil or uh, distilled oil products like kerosene, um, and more cash is staying in that, the economy of that country after the payback, which is relatively fast, has occurred. Um, beyond economic benefits, there are very important health and safety benefits. Um, reduced fire and fuel ingestion risk is a, a big one, uh, along with reduced exposure to particulate matter. Uh, so the fire and fuel, inge fuel ingestion are very acute uh, health and safety risks. And our, our colleague Evan Mills at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab released a report that really dramatically doc documents um, how big these fire and fuel ingestion risks are. Uh, it's, it's on the order of tens to hundreds of thousands of people who are impacted by fires uh, from fuel-based lighting every year. Uh, and the reduced exposure to particulate matter is also quite important. It's more intuitive in some ways. It's just people who are exposed to the smoke have chronic disease issues, cardiopulmonary disease. Uh, service quality is also better for off-grid lighting. Uh, there's better lighting uh, than kerosene or, or other fuels. It's directional. It's easy to turn on and off. You can carry it around. Uh, and also there are added non-lighting services that are uh, provided by a lot of these products. So 70% of the people in the developing world have access to a mobile phone today, uh, and many of these products can charge those mobile phones. So what that means is there are a lot of people who don't have access to electricity who have a mobile phone. Right now they have to find ways of charging that phone that don't involve their household electricity, which isn't there. Um, these products enable them to charge a mobile phone more conveniently. And finally, uh, there are important environmental benefits in terms of reduced greenhouse gas emissions from switching from fuel-based light to, to LED lighting. And I want to highlight some of those environmental benefits here. Uh, this is research that was uh, completed last year by Nick Lamb, uh, who is also here at Berkeley, um, and, and his colleagues. And it, it focuses on an estimate of the black carbon impacts of fuel-based lighting. So, and they're, they're very focused on the type of lamp that's pictured here, which is a wick lamp. Uh, it may be hard to see, but this is a lamp that's actually constructed out of an old tin can. Uh, so these are repurposed, recycled, you could say, lamps. Um, but there's a, there's a reservoir of kerosene and an open wick flame that produces a, quite a bit of soot. And that soot is a, a, also a powerful greenhouse gas. Uh, we, we call it black carbon. Uh, the map here shows the effective warming potential that uh, Nick and his colleagues estimate is induced by these kinds of wick lamps um, uh, with the black carbon, and it's substantial warming. So the, the warming effect from these wick lamps um, is equivalent to five gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent over the next 20 years. And black carbon, uh, as a greenhouse gas, is something with a very short-lived lifespan atmospherically. So that means that the warming is uh, regionally focused in the areas where it's emitted. Um, black carbon is literally black particles that absorb sunlight uh, and fall relatively quickly out of the atmosphere. Um, so eliminating fuel-based lighting would be equivalent to approximately five, eliminating 5% 5 of the total U.S. emissions. And, and that's a very large emissions reduction in the context of thinking about uh, addressing climate change. 
So that means there's a big win-win potential here for major greenhouse gas reductions while also improving energy access with a technology that's currently available and cost competitive, economically viable. So making sure that this happens, uh, it requires market support. So expanding this market to meet you know, the broad needs of the billion plus people who could adopt a better technology requires programmatic support to address the kinds of barriers that Arnie will talk about and that I've mentioned. Um, but subsidies don't appear to be necessary. These are, as they stand, uh, economically viable products for people. Th those were the global impacts. Um, I, I want to just also remind people that there are very local, very personal impacts to uh, better quality lighting. Uh, the picture here is a young man who Arnie and I met in rural Kenya who operates a, a night market stand. And he sold fruit and uh, juices, uh, cigarettes, you know, a, a, a range of kind of you know, fast-moving products out of a, a night market stand. And after he adopted a, an, a modern off-grid light, you, you can see in the pictures that the quality of the lighting in his stand improved. You know, he says that um, I stay open longer now more than before, or, or now, now than before. I've noticed more customers are attracted to my business in the evening compared to before, and they can see the goods more clearly. More customers means more sales and more money for me. And some people come far out of the way to see this lamp uh, because it's very novel. Um, this was the early days of the off-grid lighting market when not a lot of people had seen uh, LED lighting. I, I think that the novelty factor is probably wearing off in Kenya because the market is really taking off, but that lighting quality uh, factor is still there. Um, this was research that we did uh, along with Evan Mills through the Lumina project, and, and the website is here. Um, so there's a, a question just popped up about um, whether there's a source of good unbiased assessment of solar and LED product quality and efficiency. Uh, yes, there is, and, and we'll be telling you about it. So for, for the range of products that are entering the market, um, it's LED cost and performance trends that have really driven the availability of good, good performance, you know, good quality, uh, affordable products. And it's translated to big cost savings compared to kerosene or uh, other alternative uh, light sources like compact fluorescent bulbs. So this, this is a plot that shows the relatively uh, uh, sort of global trend in LED package efficacy and price. So for people who aren't lighting people, efficacy is sort of like the efficiency of an LED at converting electrical power to radiation, you know, radiative power in, in terms of lighting. So light is measured in lumens, electricity is measured in watts, efficacy is lumens per watt. Uh, so that's the x-axis of this graph. The, the y-axis is the price in terms of dollars per kilolumen. Uh, and so both the price of LED packages, so those are the chips that emit light, and also the, uh, the price has been decreasing, the performance has been increasing. Uh, just since 2010, you know, here we are in 2013, the combined price and performance trends has resulted in a 300% gain in terms of affordability, you know, in price per dollar, or, or, or sorry, price per um, performance. So it, it's very dramatic changes. And the way those have played out in solar lighting and, and for LED lighting are shown here. So on this graph, we're comparing a CFL type light. So this is the venerable CFL solar lantern that's been part of energy access uh, programs for decades. We're comparing that to what you could do in 2009 with an LED light and what you can do in 2012. Uh, and you can see that we're including not only the light source, but also what is the cost for the battery and the solar module and the balance of system to support lighting. Uh, so 
the size of the battery and the solar module are going to be related to how much power it requires for a light. So this is, this is for lighting systems that provide uniform performance, so 120 lumens for four hours a day. Um, we would expect that the total cost of a CFL-based product to meet that, that level of performance is about $65. In 2009, an LED equivalent product would have been over $80. Last year, it's more like $30, or a little bit less than $30. Uh, we haven't redone the figures for this year, but it's probably approaching 20. So it's the increase in efficacy, which is shown as going from 40 to 100 lumens per watt, along with declining costs for the LED chip, has really driven the cost of these products down and uh, has opened up the marketplace. And, and given people a lot of options that just weren't available three or four years ago. So there, there are diverse uh, products that are entering the market. A lot of different firms are trying different things in terms of form factor, uh, power levels, uh, price. And Arnie is going to uh, talk about our support for this really uh, fast-moving and emerging market for off-grid lighting. So I'm passing to Arnie now. Uh, thank you, Peter. And um, thanks to everyone for joining and uh, to uh, Energy for Change for hosting. Um, so as Peter said, I'm going to spend some time uh, talking about uh, the specific program that, uh, or set of programs that we're working with. Uh, these are a, a, a family of programs that are designed to um, support the development of uh, markets for uh, for these uh, products. Um, this work originally started with the Lighting Africa program, um, this market support work with the Lighting Africa program, which is a joint uh, uh, international finance corporation World Bank uh, initiative. Um, and uh, it, it started off as a, as a program that was aimed at uh, transforming the market for um, uh, LED-based off-grid lighting products. And the uh, framework of the program uh, was designed uh, not to subsidize the products themselves, but to instead uh, analyze the market, look at where there were barriers to development of the market, and to uh, focus on pro program activities aimed at trying to overcome uh, those barriers uh, and to uh, enable um, uh, the, uh, the market to develop and grow. Uh, so five key elements of that program uh, were uh, quality assurance um, activities, uh, activities related to um, increasing consumer awareness, um, uh, uh, activities associated with uh, enabling uh, increased access to finance for the companies uh, that were manufacturing these products, as well as uh, distributors uh, who were trying to sell them and, and consumers who, who might want to buy these on a uh, through, through some sort of a microfinance loan. Um, there were activities associated with uh, increasing information uh, to market actors, so uh, market research reports that would uh, help um, companies um, make decisions about how to, how to guide their business. Uh, and then uh, also a set of activities focused on policy and regulatory reform at the government level, so they involved uh, doing analysis and engaging with governments around things like uh, uh, reducing um, tax and tariffs on on these sorts of products um, and, and other similar measures. Uh, the work that Peter and I have been focused on is in the quality assurance area, um, but that's just one of uh, uh, these five areas that are coordinated across the uh, that were coordinated across the original uh, design of the program. Um, and there have since been some uh, additional activities that have come up. Um, in the course of the of the program, including uh, sustainability, uh, which focuses on trying to understand the um, end of life issues and uh, how to manage um, uh, uh, disposal and recycling dimensions of of, uh, of the use of these products. Um, the uh, program has uh, grown over time, and it now involves uh, collaboration between uh, the International Finance Corporation, World Bank, and U.S. Department of Energy. Um, uh, Lighting India, excuse me, Lighting Asia uh, uh, was launched in uh, in 2012. Activities uh, began in India in 2011, 
currently there are activities in India, but there are several other Asia programs that are in the process of, of, uh, of development in other, other Asian countries. Um, and um, uh, with the launch of the Asia activities, uh, a, a separate set of activities under the, um, the name Lighting Global were set up uh, in order to support both uh, uh, Asia and the Africa activities on, on things that were common to both, such as, as quality assurance. Um, so I'll spend a few minutes talking about the Lighting Global Quality Assurance Program. Um, as I said, this is a joint uh, IFC World Bank initiative, and it supports both uh, the Lighting Africa and the Lighting Asia uh, programs. Um, at the core of the of the program is a testing and verification program for LED-based off-grid lighting products, uh, most of which are charged uh, with uh, solar power, although other charging sources are also uh, also possible and sometimes used. Um, and the quality assurance framework that we originally developed uh, under Lighting Africa and that became the Lighting Global Quality Assurance Framework was recently institutionalized through the International Electrotechnical Commission, which is uh, the primary um, international standards body for uh, electrical appliances. Um, in the context of the Lighting Global Program, um, we uh, work with actors across the supply chain, everything from the manufacturer uh, to the uh, uh, people in the distribution uh, chain, um, uh, governments who um, uh, play a regulatory role in the space or have the potential to, uh, down to consumers uh, and also uh, financial institutions that uh, um, provide loans or other financial services to others across the supply chain. And um, in the context of a market supply chain, um, actors all across that supply chain need information uh, in order to make good uh, decisions about buying and selling uh, or otherwise playing a support role. And one of the things that they care most about is, uh, is the product that they're considering buying or selling or financing um, a good quality product. And so um, the uh, Lighting Global Quality Assurance Framework is aimed at trying to uh, provide information about, uh, ab about quality for, for those actors. Um, the, uh, just some highlights of the program, um, uh, uh, dating back over the last four years, we now have two test methods that are actively in use and adopted by the, the IEC. Um, we have a network uh, of four active test laboratories um, and several more that are in development, and we expect this to, to grow further over the uh, next couple of years uh, to date. Over 100 programs have been submitted by manufacturers on a, um, a paid basis for, for being tested under the program. And uh, uh, just over half of those products have met the minimum quality standards that we've set uh, for, the, for the program. So um, quite a few uh, of the products, of course, have um, uh, not met those requirements. Um, uh, of those that have uh, met the requirements um, in the Africa market, um, over uh, 2.7 million products have been have been sold, uh, and sales growth for the quality assured products is uh, extremely high. We're, we're seeing um, uh, greater than 100% annual growth, so doubling in sales uh, on an annual basis. Um, sales in uh, Asia are also quite significant. Um, our, our data aren't quite as good in, in, in Asia. We haven't been tracking uh, for nearly as long as in the Africa context, um, but are beginning to do that tracking, uh, uh, that tracking now. Um, so this is a, a program that has um, a, a fair bit of history at this point, uh, a fair bit of experience um, testing these, these products, and um, products are, are selling at quite, uh, quite a rapid rate. Um, the framework of the program it involves um, a set of uh, standardized test method methodologies that are used to evaluate the products, um, a set of minimum quality and durability standards that are used to determine if the uh, products meet uh, a set of re requirements. The um, uh, quality standards focus especially on truth in advertising, mainly ensuring that um, companies are um, or that the products end up performing at the advertised levels that the, that the uh, um, 
uh, companies are, are saying that they do. And, um, and in addition, we have a set of minimum uh, durability requirements that uh, are intended to assure, ensure that the um, uh, products will work for a, for a reasonable amount of time. Um, and then we communicate that information uh, to uh, market actors, currently primarily through a set of standardized specification sheets. So if your product meets the minimum quality standards uh, following the, the testing, uh, the, um, uh, the speci a specification sheet will be developed for that product and it will be posted online along with a, a, um, a verification certificate. And that um, allows uh, supply chain actors to verify that the, the products are, um, uh, meet those, those, uh, those minimum quality requirements. Um, we have also uh, been in the process of developing uh, or exploring possibilities to develop a more consumer-oriented uh, communication tool, um, and that, that's something that we're working towards but um, aren't yet re uh, ready to release. There's, uh, uh, it's actually quite uh, complex to manage um, uh, at a global scale a, uh, a consumer-facing um, uh, quality label, and, and so that's, that's something that we're uh, hoping to work towards in the coming years. Um, going back to the beginning of the program, we had a set of key principles for um, setting standards and for managing the quality assurance uh, framework. One of the key things is that we're very interested to ensure that end user perspectives end up informing our uh, decisions along with other key stakeholders. And so we spend a fair amount of time uh, conducting um, uh, uh, focus groups and uh, using other means to collect information about consumer perspectives. And there, one of the things we're especially interested to, to ensure is that uh, we, we end up having an appropriate balance between quality and affordability uh, for, the, uh, for the buyers in these markets. We don't want to set the bar uh, so high that uh, the products become unaffordable to the people who are interested uh, and, and who need to buy them. Um, we also don't want to set the bar too low um, so that it doesn't uh, meet their expectations. And so uh, we feel that, that that element is very important. Um, as I said, seeking that, uh, using that information to seek that balance between quality and affordability. Um, we, we also, uh, as Peter mentioned earlier, are working with a technology that is changing quite rapidly. LEDs are improving at a, at a very impressive, uh, impressive rate. And, um, and so uh, it, it's uh, important to re uh, um, revise the, the um, thresholds for meeting the requirements fairly regularly in order to keep up with, with uh, technology and market trends. Um, at the same time, we're trying to re maintain a predictable, stable framework so that everybody knows what to expect. And so we try and also seek that, uh, an appropriate balance between updating and maintaining a certain degree of, of predictability. Um, as I mentioned, uh, consumer uh, uh, perspectives are a very important part of uh, the, uh, the the framework from our from our uh, in our opinion, and uh, so we've managed things through uh, uh, through the use of a, a, a large number of focus groups where we collect information about people's perspectives. And one of the things that we've done is um, just try and understand what. Uh, end users think about uh, in terms of the information they want to have at the time of uh, purchasing a product. And uh, we use that information to inform um, which metrics or which areas uh, uh, we should focus on in terms of, um, uh, of, of the quality standards. Uh, and so uh, in um, focus groups uh, across five African countries uh, conducted um, over the last few years, we found that um, the top five things that people are interested to know are, uh, first of all, they want to know the light output, how bright will this, uh, will this light be. They're very interested in warranty terms. Um, so if, if uh, something goes wrong, what will I be able to do? What are, the, what are the possibilities for repair and replacement? They're very interested in robustness. Uh, and so durability is, is very important to people. They, they're familiar with things that break. and uh, and uh, want something that uh, uh, has a certain degree of, of durability. They're very interested in mobile phone charging. Uh, and so in addition to lighting, uh, they want to know if the product has, uh, has mobile phone charging capability. And they're very interested also in 
the amount of uh, operational time, the level of service that they'll get from this product. So how many uh, hours of lighting, for example, would they, will they get at that brightness level? And so a lot of our quality assurance framework uh, is informed by um, uh, these consumer perspectives on, on which metrics are, are most important. And we've conducted similar work and gotten similar results uh, in, a, in a South Asia context. Um, we, uh, I mentioned earlier that the, that balance between quality and affordability is, is quite important. And so we've uh, worked very hard to make sure that, um, that uh, products on the 10 to $20, uh, 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 in the 20, 10 to $20 price range are ones that can uh, uh, meet our requirement. We've uh, seen that people are, are quite interested in products in that price range, and um, that's a price level that is uh, affordable to a fairly large fraction of uh, households in sub-Saharan Africa, and data from Indi India give uh, a fairly similar result. And so uh, we're looking at what consumer perspectives are in terms of uh, characteristics and, and what things they want to know about a product before they buy. Uh, we're also considering uh, the price dimension and uh, other uh, bro broader uh, uh, broader approaches to, uh, to uh, affordability. Um, uh, in addition to consumers, of course, we're uh, engaged with uh, a, a, a wide set of stakeholders. Uh, we, we spend a fair amount of time engaging with governments and uh, agencies within governments that are uh, interested and active in the sector, uh, as well as with uh, private sector entities. And, and on the private sector side, the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association is a, a, a newly formed industry association that um, uh, we engage with uh, uh, fairly frequently. And we also work very closely with individual um, uh, uh, stakeholders, um, uh, businesses that are operating in the space uh, across the supply chain, um, as well as a wide range of other stakeholders, such as uh, test labs and, and uh, 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 development organizations that are active in in this space as well, and so uh, we see this as a as a framework that's pr providing uh, an important um, uh, uh, um, set of information about quality. Uh, it, it provides a consumer protection uh, um, um, uh, dimension to the market, and uh, and also uh, involves this this broad uh, conversation across a wide range of stakeholders. Um, uh, we uh, just, uh, um, actually yesterday, announced a, a new set of um, uh, quality re requirements for the program. Uh, that was uh, um, uh, a revision that we've been working on for the, the, the past uh, four or five months. Uh, and so we, we're just uh, at the tail end of a, of a stakeholder process associated with revising our minimum quality standards uh, going forward. Um, there are... Um, uh, there's a process that we'll engage in associated with revising uh, test methods for the program, in, in collaboration with the International Electro uh, excuse me, the International Electro Technical Commission, uh, the IEC, and so uh, we'll continue to stay active uh, both in terms of revising the standards and test methods as as uh, uh, the market continues to change, as well as in providing the the um, uh, testing and verification uh, services and um, uh, um, uh, communication uh, to the market uh, as we have over the over the past few years. Um, uh, at this point, I think we can go to questions, and it looks like there have uh, been uh, some questions that have come in so far. So, let us just quickly review some of those questions, and and uh, we'll be able to circle back to uh, to answer them. Thank you so much, Arnie. Uh, this is obviously a, a very comprehensive and uh, overarching uh, presentation. And we have a few questions here that, that kind of dive deep and others that are a little bit more across the board. So we'll, we'll try to get to all of these. And I do appreciate if everybody enters their questions into the Q&A uh, window so that, that we can tackle them. So um, uh, some of them have, I think, already been addressed, so, so uh, I think we'll skip a few. But uh, there are some specific ones. I'm going to tackle this one here from Paul Scott. Is there a, a labeling or a logo system in place, something akin to the Rainforest Alliance for Coffee, 
um, where you know consumers, I suppose, uh, or other uh, stakeholders can get a better understanding of a particular uh, lamp or a lighting source uh, as has been tested by Lighting uh, Global. Um, so at this point, we do not have a, a consumer-facing uh, label in place. And uh, what we do have is the standardized um, uh, specification sheet framework and, and a verification system that works through a website. And that's a, a system that is aimed at this point primarily at actors further up the supply chain than, uh, than the end users. Um, and the reason for that focus, uh, we felt that Initially, it was it was most important and most uh, viable to, to focus our outreach on information about quality um, a, a bit further up the supply chain. Um, uh, partly because it's it's much less costly to, to reach um, uh, people at that level because there are just fewer of them, and uh, um, our program resources uh, were not unlimited, and um, uh, partly because um, the, the distributors and the, the um, financial organizations were in a good position to uh, make decisions about uh, about um, the selection of, of, of quality products. Um, we are very interested to move uh, further uh, further down the, the supply chain in terms of being able to reach out to consumers with information about quality and the development of uh, a, a label that would go on the product, on the packaging, um, is something that we're uh, we're interested in moving towards. I, I think it's very important not to, to try and do that too soon uh, when you don't mm -hmm. have all of the resources in place uh, to, to achieve that. It, it's very expensive um, and very important to, uh, if once you do put a label out, to police that label uh, to, to have the resources in place to make sure that counterfeiting won't become uh, a, a very big issue. And I would say that uh, um, we've been moving slowly towards that, but haven't yet reached the point where we're in a position to do that on a global scale. We do have some um, consumer-facing outreach uh, that does focus on quality in the context of consumer awareness campaigns. And I, I would say that that's been most effective in the Kenya context, uh, where the consumer awareness campaigns have been quite extensive. And there are there's a campaign that's planned for India uh, that will be coming up in the in the new calendar year. But um, uh, the, uh, a consumer-facing label is something we're quite interested to pursue, but haven't yet uh, haven't yet pulled the trigger on. Certainly, and I'm sure we can take some examples from uh, pharmaceutical uh, labeling and, and some of the issues that they've experienced in, in the developing world and trying to police those labels. Um, Speaking to your um, point here about consumer awareness campaigns, there was a few questions that came in regarding supporting of that type of work, I suppose, as part of the Letting India program. Um, are there any opportunities for uh, individuals to actually uh, be able to get engaged in this kind of work or groups of volunteers uh, to join at the ground level? Can you speak to that, please? Um. Uh, and, and this is an India-focused question, or just a, a yeah? It's a, it seems to be an India-focused question, but we can also kind of cover it overall if you're interested. Um, I, I would say in the India context that the India program is working towards uh, uh, launching a um, consumer awareness campaign that would happen um, uh, starting uh, sometime in the first half of next year. Um, don't know what the specific plans are in terms of uh, in terms of all of the details, but we'll have a better sense within a few weeks. I'm I'm going to visit with the India team in Delhi um, uh, in just a couple of weeks, and, and so I'll have a better sense of exactly what they're planning. Um, uh, the idea of uh, involving um, uh, individuals or other uh, organizations is a, is a really interesting one, and um, certainly I think. Uh, there is always an interest to, to, to um, uh, think about partnerships and, and what might be possible. So um, if there's a, a specific thought there or a specific organization that's interested in in, uh, in, in playing some role, I'd be interested to hear about it, and uh, I could certainly uh, raise that with, uh, with some of our colleagues at, at, uh, with that Lighting Asia program in, in New Delhi. Very cool. So uh, another question came in, kind of, I guess, uh, swinging over to the supply chain side of the conversation and uh, the market research uh, side of the house for Lighting Global. 
Uh, can you speak a little bit to um, you know the source countries for these lanterns? Uh, can they be the same as the user or consumer countries? And uh, wh why not have lighting in India come from India? Um, there, I think we've been fairly agnostic about the the uh, question of where the products should be manufactured. Um, uh, we're certainly uh, very interested and open to the idea that uh, products would be manufactured in the country where they're uh, where they're um, being used. But we also think that uh, um, if uh, if a product is manufactured in a in a different country, that shouldn't uh, necessarily be a barrier to to um, making that that product accessible to to uh, people who want to use it in a in a given country. It seems to us, given the very high high uh, payback uh, for these products and the at, for, uh, at the end consumer level and the um, the, uh, the the whole wide range of, of other benefits, uh, we would want to make sure that the the best uh, and most affordable products uh, are available to people regardless of where they're made uh, ar around the world. Um, certainly, there are a number I of products. You could add. Go ahead. The majority of these products are produced around Hong Kong, that sort of Hong Kong, Shenzhen area. And there are a lot of good reasons why you'd want to manufacture a product there related to the network of component suppliers that are available. And people are just able to drive down cost and have good quality products um, from that region. There's nothing that prevents people outside of that area from producing good quality products. And there are certainly manufacturers that do. Uh, but if, if the concern is about the energy that's required to ship the products, for instance, uh, the shipping energy is a tiny fraction of the total energy it requires to make these. Uh, so the shipping energy and cost concerns are, are really not part of the, the picture. Um, and, and then following up on the economic dimension of this, uh, say just uh, as an example, in a country like, like India, um, India does have a, a fair fraction of the products that it, uh, the off-grid lighting products that are sold there are manufactured in India, and a, a fair number are also uh, made outside the country. Um, um, India is a, a significant importer of, of petroleum products uh, as well, and so uh, um, uh, in terms of, of uh, importing things, uh, if you use an off-grid lighting product, whether it was produced in India or uh, in China or elsewhere, um, the macroeconomic benefits for India, if that product is reasonably good quality uh, and um, uh, reduces the use of, of uh, imported kerosene uh, or, or imported petroleum that was used to, to produce that kerosene, the, the macroeconomic benefits for India are, are quite significant. Very interesting. So in, in terms of economic effects and economic models, I'm going to swing over to another question here. Um, have there been any developments in utilizing pay-as-you-go for solar lanterns with or without mobile money that you can speak to? Um, this listener is familiar with PicoScale pay-as-you-go uh, uh, called Angada. But so what are your thoughts about this model slash technology for small-scale lighting? Uh, Peter, you want to start, or I, I can take it either way? Sure. Um, well, I, I can see there are a, a great number of approaches right now to, to using pay-as-you-go um, basic as a financing mechanism for solar lanterns. So on, on Gaza is one. Uh, there are also uh, MCOPA is one that's uh, active in Kenya. Um, there's another called... I'm forgetting now, Indigo, I think. Um, in, in any case, there are tens of these uh, different startup types who are um, entering the space. I think it's a very important development because it lets people spend money much in the same way as they currently do with kerosene, which is in small amounts day to day. Um, as we saw in the, when we showed the, the slide of people's income, uh, even a $20 product can be weeks of income for, for people who might want to buy them. So if there was a way to do pay, uh, microfinance, essentially, or pay-as-you-go for 
uh, for products. It, it really opens up the possibilities for people who are currently spending, uh, you know, relatively small amounts of money, but day after day on kerosene, it adds up pretty quickly. Um, that could add up to the cost of a solar lantern. Um, uh, the, the traditional difficulty has been the transaction costs on those loans. Um, and with a combination of mobile money and automated tracking and automated payment systems, like these pay-to-go systems, um, it can drive the transaction costs on these financing schemes low enough that it's viable for relatively low-cost products in the $20 to $100 range. So it, it's very important. I, I think that it wouldn't surprise me a bit if two years from now, the majority of products are purchased this way, if, if this technology is really able to take off. Um, there, there are a lot of people who are able to purchase them without pay-as-you-go. They're able to save money. Uh, but a much broader segment of the market, I think, will be amenable to them uh, if, it, if it really works. And I think it will. And, and just a, as a point of clarification, um, typically pay-as-you-go systems are, um, it's, a, it's a payment mechanism where um, uh, a, uh, a person will, will uh, gain access to a product um, and will make payments using uh, some sort of mobile banking scheme um, or, or some other scheme where they're, where they're um, paying on a day-to-day -day basis and their ability to use that product is associated with, with the fact that they, they made a payment. And so uh, uh, one scheme, for example, um, uh, the way that you buy the product is you put a, a small deposit on the product and then uh, it, yeah, you get it and you install it at your home and you make uh, th uh, 365 payments, small payments, um, which could be over the course of one year or you could stretch it out over a slightly longer period of time to, to make those 365 payments. And every day that you've made a payment, uh, you can use the product. If you don't, if you don't make the payment, then then the product doesn't work for you that day. And uh, once you've made those 365 payments, then then you own the product and don't have to make any more, more payments. Um, and the, these schemes tend to be enabled most in places where the mobile uh, banking sector uh, is is very well developed. And so uh, places like Kenya. Uh, pay-as-you-go is really, I think, on the verge of taking off. Other countries where the mobile banking sector is more limited, um, it makes it a bit harder to, to manage these systems. Right. There, there are schemes that don't rely on mobile banking, that, that, that use scratch cards. Um, so that, that's one way that people have worked around it. Um, but those are, let's get into the weeds. So. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Uh, we're we're going to, again, now kind of shift over to the, the quality assurance standards. And uh, you started to speak a little bit lightly to the, the evolution of the standards to also the aspect of sustainability. And a few questions have come in related to that specifically. For example, one, one uh, listener wanted to know if there are any health or safety issues with a light, produce, uh, light produced by LED um, that uh, you guys are considering as, as part of maybe sustainability or other um, of, of the met test methods. So if maybe you can expand a little bit on what sustainability would mean uh, within the context of a lighting global's uh, standards and um, perhaps uh, indicate how that product ownership um, is going to be uh, noted. Sure. I, I would say that there are at least three dimensions uh, that we think about when we think about sustainability. Uh, one uh, is just related very simply to product durability. Um, the longer a product lasts, uh, the longer it is before it has to be, uh, before it breaks and, and ends up being either a disposal or a recycling question. And so the durability question, of course, uh, um, is, is one of the things that we consider in the context of sustainability. A second dimension has to do with um, uh, end-of-life waste issues, um, both from the, the perspective of solid waste. These are mostly plastic products. Uh, and so uh, if they fail and are disposed of, they can become part of the solid waste stream. Um, but, but also uh, there are concerns about things like batteries, which uh, in many cases contain, um, uh, or in some cases contain ha hazardous materials. And uh, those materials ha have potential to be recycled, um, but, uh, but uh, managing that, that process is not a simple one. And so we're concerned about that issue. And then the third uh, dimension uh, that we would think about there is, is related to health and safety. 
associated with the use of the products. And it, it seems like the first question you're asking uh, there is, is or referring to is in relationship to that third dimension. Um, and um, at, at this point, um, we think that the, the, the research that we've done and the research that's out there indicates that the um, light levels associated with uh, these LEDs um, um, uh, are not associated with any significant uh, health and safety issues. It is certainly possible to design very bright LED products um, that if you uh, stared at them for a significant amount of time could uh, could result in um, in uh, some concerns about uh, about eye safety but um, but the products that we're working with tend to not be uh, bright enough to, uh, to to do that um, we have uh, this is an area that we pay quite a bit of attention to and one of the things that we've done over the course of time is develop a series of, of what we call briefing notes. Uh, some of are focused on technical topics. Some are focused on um, uh, environmental and, and health-related uh, topics. But they're they're basically short expert papers that we write um, with um, uh, primarily with the manufacturers and um, others in the supply chain uh, in mind as a target audience as a way of trying to provide key information that they can use in the in the product design. Uh, 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 process in order to either make their products work better or or be safer. And so we have two sets of briefing notes, one called the technical notes and the other called the eco-design notes. And one of the notes that we've written and is available on our website focuses on that question of, of um, uh, um, the health dimensions of, of eye safety and, uh, and LED use. And um, that's something that we'll continue to monitor as health research in that area continues. But everything that we've understood so far suggests that there aren't, uh, for the range of products that we're working with, there aren't significant um, uh, uh, health and safety issues uh, associated with them. That was an incredibly thorough answer uh, to, to the question. And uh, I do apologize to our listeners as we are currently over time. And I know that a lot of you had more questions uh, that you wanted to get addressed. But we will make sure to open with our um, presenters in order to have them address some of these by email. And perhaps we'll even consider doing a follow-up for a news article in order to uh, really address some of these. Uh, kind of key questions. I'd like to thank you all for participating. I'd like to certainly thank our presenters and also thank all of the attendees for your great questions and for your engagement. Um, for those of you who are interested in getting your professional development hours, the code is listed on the slide that's being shown um, along with the email address for you to contact our present uh, to contact uh, the administrators for the CEU um, PH hours. If you have more questions, please do feel free to email us at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. And don't forget to become an E4C member so that you can get information directly in your inbox on upcoming webinars. Thank you all again. Have a great day or evening or afternoon, wherever you may be. And we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Take care.